Hey folks, this is Pastor Mike, and you're listening to our Wednesday night Bible study online. We hope you enjoy this, and you can hear more of our sermons and teachings at www.visitbethelchurch.org. God bless you, and have a great day. Our Father, I come before you tonight, and I thank you, dear God, Lord, for just a minute that we get to spend, Lord, just telling you, Lord, what's in our heart, what's on our mind. Thank you, dear God, Lord, that you're my counselor. And Lord, I can tell you anything. I can tell you good things. I can rejoice. I can tell you thank you. I can tell you bad things. I can complain to you, God. And you just listen. And you just listen, God. And Lord, I'm thankful, dear God, for that. And Lord, listen to these people tonight. Everybody, Lord, in this room, dear God, you've put it in them, Lord, to, Lord, to have somebody in their life that will just listen to them. God, you're that somebody. Listen to your people tonight as they pray, as they call out unto you, God, and as they ask, Lord, for the help that they need, as they give their thanksgivings to you, Lord, for all the things, Lord, that you've done to them, that you've been to them. <clears throat> Lord, we just ask, God, that you just bless tonight's lesson. And Lord, just open up our ears and our minds and our hearts, dear God, and give us understanding from your word. Lord, this is the bread of life. Pray, dear God, Lord, that you would nourish us and continue us on. Lord, help us to know, dear God, that you never, you never break a promise. Lord, have your way in our hearts tonight. Teach us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 38. Would you turn there, please? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 38. Um, the first part of this, uh, I mentioned last, uh, last Wednesday... Um, I'm, I'm not going not gonna to really deal with you read it. It's a very simple story, and God will give you understanding. But Judah, um, <clears throat> he, had, uh, he married a wife, married a Canaanite wife. And I want you to understand, any time we're dealing with Judah, we're dealing with something that eventually is going to show us an illustration of Jesus Christ. Of course, I keep saying that. The whole Bible is an illustration of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is the testimony of Jesus Christ from front to back. Beginning to end, and all, everything in the middle is a picture of Jesus Christ. But here we have Judah. And we know that the, 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 uh, the, the king is going to come from Judah. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And uh, so we have a, anytime you have a birthing taking place, you're looking at a picture of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because that's how God chose to do it, was, was by birth. And so we're going to deal with a birthing story here. Judah, I, I would point out to you, Judah is the fourth son of, of Jacob. And that, and that means something. The third son of Jacob was Levi. Levi was the tribe that God chose to be the priest because of his numbering. Okay, Transgression and sin deals with the number three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And that number shows us that there is always a price to pay for, for our sin. And if you read the third book of the Bible, Leviticus you'll understand that, there, that the sins of mankind always has a price to it, okay? When we go to the story of Jesus on Calvary, how many pieces of silver was he sold for? 30, okay, the price of sin. How many crosses was there on Golgotha? And there he's numbered with the transgressors, okay? So that's what, that's what Leviticus represents with that third son. Jesus, however, was a high priest unto God, but he was not from the tribe of Levi. And if you read Hebrews, it very plainly points out to you that doctrine that Jesus was not a Levite and yet he was a priest. He was not of the order of Levi. He was of the order of Melchizedek, which is not an earthly realm priesthood. It is a heavenly realm priesthood, that, which consists of, of angelic priests and an order of priests. And Jesus was the high priest of that order. He is God's high priest. And, and that's what we see in the number four because the number four deals with the spiritual realm. And so here is Judah who is the fourth born son of Jacob. And Jesus comes from this lineage. Now, Judah marries a Canaanite wife. He has a son by the name of Ur. And Ur dies. He marries a, he marries a wife named Tamar. And Ur dies before he is able to have a child with her. Onan refused to have a child with her, and God took his life. Judah then has a third son that he is, and, and you have to understand, we're going to look at Tamar just for a little bit tonight. 
Uh, Tamar is the, is the woman rejected here. And Judah has promised Tamar his third son, but he really, if, he feigns to do this. He doesn't end up uh, giving her to his third son. So we're going to see uh, the sordid details, and, and there's a lot of lessons in here. One of them is the sordid details of family relationships. And everybody's got sordid details in their family. Somebody say amen. Okay? And we're going to see, we're going to see a, 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 a bad story. But when you go to Matthew chapter 1, you see the lineage of Jesus given. You see Abraham's name mentioned. You see Isaac's name mentioned. You see Jacob's name mentioned. You're going to see Judah's name mentioned because he's from the tribe of Judah. And then you're going to see one of the sons of Judah here by the name of Perez. And that's the lineage that Jesus came through when he, was, when he came to this earth by birth the first time. And there's a very, very neat story here. But the idea that all these patriarchs like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, and especially Judah, these were sinful, wicked men. They had sin in their lives. And Abraham passed his sinful nature down to Isaac, who passed it down to Jacob, who passed it down to Judah, who distributed it down through the line, and Jesus ends up inheriting this sinful nature. I don't believe that Jesus was born and never wanted to sin, never had a desire. I'm telling you, he, had, he was born in flesh, yet without sin. But God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So Jesus has all of this literally in his genetics, in his DNA. And that's what he takes to the cross. And if you think your family's messed up, just read this family. It's messed up. Amen? And Jesus took it all and he hung it on the cross. Somebody say amen. So your family member is not without hope. So now... Um, Let's, uh, let's see here. Let's pick it up in verse, um, let's pick it up in verse 11. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up into his sheep shares to Timnath, he and his friend Ahira, the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to uh, Timnath to shear his sheep. And I want you to look at what Tamar did. And Tamar uh, put her widow's garments off from her, and covered her with a veil, wrapped herself, sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. In other words, Shelah was the youngest son, and he was not old enough to take a wife. He would have, according to Jewish tradition and according to the law, he would have then taken Tamar to wife to raise up the, inher the inherited seed of, of, to be Judah's firstborn. Okay? And, um, and, and, but Shelah was too young. But Judah had promised Tamar that when Shelah gets old enough, he's going to be your wife. Well, Shelah's old enough and it's not happening. And so... Tamar, in her mind, says, I'm going to get this child one way or the other. So here's what she did. She dressed herself in the attire of a harlot. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come into thee, for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, and that, that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, wilt thou give me a pledge to thou send it? In other words, I, I, I need some earnest here. Okay? And um, he said, what, verse 18, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it to her, came in unto her. That's sort of like his identification, his driver's license. I did that one time when I was in college. I was talking to these boys about... Uh, when I was in college. When you're in college, you ain't got no money. Amen? I mean, you just ain't, you're broke. No money. And I was on my way to work one time, just across town there working in a shoe store. Man, I was flat out of gas, and I was going to stop this little gas station just a, a half a block from where I work. I could, they could see where I worked there. And I put $5 worth of gas in the car. Five, this is 1984. $5 worth of gas. 
okay? Man, that's half a tank, okay? So I put $5 worth of gas in there, and I walked inside and reached, and, and I opened my wallet, and I, man, I didn't have a dime in there. And I'm going, where is that money? I don't know where in the world it was. And um, so I pulled out my driver's license, and I handed it down there. I said, and I told him who I was. I told him where I went to school at. It was just down the road. They all knew what it was. And I said, I work right over here. I said, if you'll hold on to this, I'm taking a big chance here driving in, in the state of Oklahoma without a license. I said, but if you'll hold this for me, I said, I'm telling you that come Friday when I get paid, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come back with this money, and you hold my driver's license until that happens. And they kind of said, well, okay. And, buddy, I want to tell you what, when Friday come around and that got my paycheck, I went to the bank, and I cashed that dude, and I ran over there with five, and I said, give me my license back, hurry. Okay? But anyway, it was just, it was his identification. It was his signet. Something had probably a ring with, a, with, a, with some sort of design on it, maybe. That, that's what a signet is. Um, and that, that design was unique to him and his bracelets and his staff. Okay? She took those in earnest. Okay? So now, in verse, um, and he, in verse 18, again, halfway through, and he gave it to her and, she, and came into her and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent, uh, sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. In other words, he said, take this goat over there and get my stuff back. Okay? Uh, but he found her not. He went looking in the place where she was, and she wasn't there. So anyway, then he asked the men of that place, saying, where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, there was no harlot. We don't know what you're talking about. Okay, no harlot here. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. You know what it sounds like to me in, in verse 23? We need to hurry up and find this gal. Lest we be shamed. And, and the guys are probably going, what's this we? You're the one that went into her. You're the one whose ring and bracelets and staff she's holding. You're the one. And I'm going to tell you something. Okay? Just, just kind of get this out in the open. Harlotry was just as wrong then as it is now. It's an abomination before God. It's sin. Amen? It's sin. It ought not be done. It, it was a shame back then, and it's a shame now. Okay? And so I, I just kind of think about the reality of this situation. Here he is. He, he doesn't have a wife anymore, and he goes into this harlot. Okay? Well, he's like any man that tries to play around and, and with this stuff, try to keep it hid, try to keep it covered. This stupid congressman. Amen? Amen? If you're that stupid to take pictures of yourself and put them on the Internet, what is the Internet? It's all the computers in the world all connected together. And everybody knows that once something goes out on the Internet, it's, you can't get it back. Okay? And Judah is trying to avoid the shame of this deal. He's saying, you need to find this gal and, get this, get, get, and pay her and get my stuff back. And what is... Uh, Oh, who is it? Ran for president a few years ago. It's in trouble right now. Huh? John Edwards? He's being looked at right now and investigated for spending presidential campaign funds to keep these gals quiet. And this is what Judah's dealing with. Okay? Listen, sin will run over you like a freight train. You can just run and run and try to stay ahead of it, and it won't work. Be sure your sin will find you out. I just like the rhythm of that. Amen. Be sure your sin will find you out. That sound, that, I ought to make a song about that. Amen. But anyway, verse 24. And it came to pass about three months, and, and Judas just sweating. Can't find her. Came to pass about three months after, it was told Judas, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judas said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Now, there's a lot of lessons in this passage. One of them is fidelity, purity, faithfulness. Okay? Another one is having a judgmental nature that you want everybody else to burn for their sin while you get off scot-free. 
We've got more of that in us than we like to admit. Can I hear somebody say amen? We are very, we condemn, we chastise others, we look down our nose at them, look at you, look how you're living, look how your life is, look at you, look at you, look at you. And the Holy Ghost of God is so faithful to us when we're like that. Holy Ghost is going, Psst. And the Holy Ghost is just reminding you of that pit that you used to be in. Yes, amen. Yesterday. Yes, amen. amen? Yes. Listen, I know sin's wrong, and I know there's a lot of wickedness in this world, and there's a lot of people who don't care about their wickedness. They don't care. From, I mean, and, I, and, and at some point, we just kind of back up and say, you know what, I, I, there's, there's, there's more and more of this world that I don't want to be a part of. Amen? But if God can save you, He can save anybody. If God can rescue your soul out of the deep pit that you was in, God can do the person next to you, the person over here, the person over there, the person up here at the smokehouse tavern up here. God can save every one of them in there because at one time that would have been you up there at smokehouse tavern. That would have been you. And if God can save you, God can save them. Okay? Um, God will bring everybody into con condemnation and this and that and the other. And I don't mind preaching sin and preaching it hard and preaching it hot and preaching the condemnation of sin. But preach the gospel that goes with it. Amen? They don't have to be burned. They don't have to be burned. Okay? So anyway... And by, this is, this is, now listen to this now, there's a theme in the Bible, and I haven't worked it all out yet. But this is another harlot in the Bible that has been redeemed. Tamar, that's her name. We have Rahab in the days of Joshua going into Jericho. A harlot being redeemed. God can save anybody, amen? But there's a theme in the Bible that just kind of goes from that to that, and there's probably other places I can't remember, and I'm trying to study it out, trying to get discernment on really what this is. And I kind of think I have a grasp on it, but I, I don't want to really teach something just half-baked, okay? Um, and so anyway, I'm just going to kind of hold it in until I get it all. But here we have a harlot who's, who's, who can be redeemed. Uh, Judah wants, to, wants her burnt. Verse 25, but when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, by the man whose these are, Listen, this gal's wise. She's smart. When they come to get her for the harlotry, she, hang on a second. And she had the bracelet and the staff and the signet. She said, by the man whose these are, I am with child. And she said, discern, I pray of thee, whose are these, the signet, the bracelets, and staff? Tell me, Judah, tell us who these are. And Judah acknowledged them. You might want to write this down or just kind of make a mental note. If you're guilty, plead guilty. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. If you're guilty, plead guilty. Best thing for you. If you've... If, who, in here, who in here knows how many laws are in the Bible? How many laws of God are there in the Bible? Uh, there's 600 and some odd. I don't know how many there are. I don't know how many there are. And there's a lot of them that can be broken. And a lot of them that are. And the best thing for you to do in life, and I preach this over and over again, as a Christian, the best thing going for you is admit you're wrong to God. If God's trying to convict you about some area of your life, the worst thing that you can do is say, well, God, Pastor so-and-so on the radio said that was okay. It's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Or we try to justify our own sins in our own mind. Or we try to cover up our own sins. And that's what Judah was trying to do. He was desperately trying to get this goat to Tamar to get the ring and the, and the, and the bracelets and the staff back so that he wouldn't be found out. What was David trying to do? The exact same thing. Cover it up. Cover it up. Don't let anybody know. Hide it. Bury it. And that's what he was trying to do. And it overran him like a speeding freight train. And it all catches up with Judah. And Judah, kind of like this congressman the other day, standing there crying, bawling his eyes out. You know why? He's caught. Admit it. Admit it. 
You don't, you don't always have to have your sin exposed to everybody else in the world. Amen. And thank God you don't. But God's the one who already knows about it. And when the Holy Ghost comes calling on you and saying, You've done this. I was there. I watched you do it. I wrote it down in the book. I've got the print. Notice we have the signet, the bracelets, and the staff. There's that number three again. As the tokens for this man's sin. God wrote it down. The Holy Ghost is telling you, I got a record of it right here. Best thing for you to do is do what David did in Psalm 32, or Psalm 51. I acknowledge my transgression. When Nathan the prophet came to him, it's like we talked about on Friday fun night. When Nathan the prophet came to David and exposed his, his sin with Bathsheba, David said, I have sinned before I have sinned. I, I did it. Best thing you can do. Best thing you can do. Especially when it's God dealing with you. It's your best policy. And so anyway, Judah acknowledged him and said, She has been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. He confessed his sin, and it was over with. It was done. Okay? Now look at verse 27. Now we're going to have a birth here. And I think, I like births in the Bible. Births are all about either the Christ or the Antichrist. Okay? I was, I've been kind of going through just personally, just kind of studying 1 Samuel. That's kind of how I got this, uh, the kingdom of God deal. And uh, this thing about Ichabod being born, okay? Uh, I think Ichabod is a type of the Antichrist. I think he's a prophetic picture of the Antichrist because Ichabod means the glory is departed, okay? And I think there's, I think there's going to be a birthing here someday. The Antichrist literally is going to be birthed out, just out of the womb of the earth. He's going to be birthed. And that will signify to the world the glory of God is now departed. What a time that's going to be. Amen? Amen. Listen, I want to be with Jesus when that takes place, don't you? Amen? I want, listen, I don't want to be here. Amen? And so anyway, be ready. But anyway, verse uh, 27. It came to pass in the time of her travail. That is a birthing term and that is a prophetic term. All through the Bible you see travail, travail. What was it that we're told in uh, 1 Thessalonians, let's see, what is it? First, uh, for when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon them as what? Travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Are you seeing the biblical pictures here? Okay. So it came to pass when she travailed that one, now what had happened was she's got twins. She has twins. Okay? This is not the only place in the Bible where there's twins. Jacob and Esau were twins. And what do we see with Jacob and Esau? Esau was the firstborn. And yet Jacob receives the firstborn blessing. Now, now we have two sons inside the womb of Tamar. Okay? The tribe of Judah. And so anyway, so she's travailed. And it came to pass, verse 28, that one put out his hand. Okay? So according to, according to the tradition and everything else, this would have been the firstborn son who received all the firstborn rights as a son. And so when this happens, the midwife makes a token of this by tying a scarlet cord around this. By the way, here, let's deal with another harlot story and a scarlet cord. Amen. Go to the book of Joshua chapter 6 and read about Rahab the harlot and what was the signet, what was it that signified that she was going to be saved? A scarlet cord, and I've heard them old time preachers talk about how there's a scarlet cord woven all throughout the pages of this King James Bible that teaches you about Jesus and His salvation and His blood being poured out as remission of our sins. Somebody say amen. amen. Though your sins be like crimson, they shall be, the, though their sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And that's what that scarlet cord signifies is the fact that yes, they are sinful. Yes, here, here it is, right here. Zara and Perez is what these two boys' names is. They were conceived in iniquity. They were conceived in harlotry. They were conceived in unrighteousness. And a scarlet cord denotes the fact that what is scarlet one day is one day going to become white as snow. Somebody, I don't care if you shout, and I don't care who knows it, amen? Get happy about the fact that Jesus took you when you was an old dead rotten sinner and should have been cast into hell and God forgave all your sins and made you white as snow. Somebody say amen. amen. 
Amen, that is good. And any my preaching either. It's the gospel. Amen, the gospel's good. So anyway, watch this now. They tied that scarlet cord around his hand, okay? And said, verse 29, hast thou, how hast thou broken forth? Okay, no, let's see here. I, I missed something here. Go back 28. Here we go. I got too excited and got, lost my place, okay? And the midwife took him bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, this came out first. We have rules. Jesus said we have rules. He who is first shall be last. And he who is last shall be first in the kingdom of heaven. And God came to Israel first. The seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came to them in their iniquity, in their sin. You'll read uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. God said he took Jerusalem while she was out bloody, thrown away in the field when she was first born. Took her and loved her and cleaned her up and dressed her up. And I mean he loved her. And she went out and did what? Whoredoms. Committed harlotry against God with everybody that walked by. She laid down for everybody that walked by. That's how sick she was. And God loves her and he's going to redeem her one of these days. Somebody said, oh man, that's good. But she said, this came out first. In verse 29, and it came to pass as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out. And she said, how hast thou broken forth? And I want you to look at this. This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Therese. You don't need to read and know Hebrew. Okay? To know, to, to, who on here wants to take a wild guess on what the word Therese means? Breach. Now, how do you know that, Pastor Mike? I need a double witness. We're fixing to find one here in a minute. Okay? Now, afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Now, very quickly, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Very quickly, and I'm going to show you something here. Okay? Oh, I love the Bible. Okay? Matthew chapter 1. This, the, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat who? Therez and Zerah. Notice now that Therez is mentioned first. Not Zerah. Judas begat Therez and Zerah of Tamar, and then Therez begat Israel. Okay? Therez now represents a breach. That's what his name is, okay? Now, take your Bible. Oh, let's see here. T turn to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And now, let me tell you this story again, okay? I'm going to keep telling the story, and I'm going to keep telling the story, and keep telling the story. The story is God selected a people whom he loved. It was the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he loved them. God said in Deuteronomy 7, he said, I didn't call you because you were the most in this world. I called you because I loved you. And God set his love upon Israel, and he still loves them. Are they wicked? Yes. But see, when you truly love somebody, it doesn't matter how dirty and how bad they get, you still love them. When you really love somebody, you grieve over their sin, you grieve over their lifestyle, you grieve over the condition, but the truth is... You still love them. And I would to God tonight, I want you to listen to this, I would to God that God would teach me that kind of love. Amen. That kind of love. So that I wouldn't be so doggone judgmental against everybody that I meet that I don't like because of how they look. And I am that way. And the truth be known, you are too. So we're all in the same, we're fellowshipping tonight, amen? All in the same ship here, amen. okay? We judge on appearance. We judge on how we figure their people's lifestyles are. I see young people now. I saw a boy at McDonald's tonight. I mean, he, he was having such a hard time keeping that dog hair out of his eyes. He just, his head was over like this all the time. He couldn't have been 11, 12 years old. Lisa was just going, okay? Just, he just, every now and then you just give it a flip and it just hang there over his eyes. Just, yeah, like Lindsay's got going back there. Cousin it, okay? And I'm going, you idiot, won't you get you a haircut, Amen. You know what? That boy's lost and he needs Jesus. Amen? Jesus will take care of him after that. I don't, he don't need me to preach to him. Amen? 
And I'm just telling you, quit. I wish that I could love people that I don't like. I wish that I could love and care about and want to see people saved that is diametrically opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wish that I had that, and maybe that ought to be something I would pray about more often. Amen? Amen. And I have somebody in my mind right now that I've been with recently that I reject because of, because of the sin that's in their life. And I, I tell you what, God's making me grieve over that. Making me grieve over that. That's somebody that Jesus died for and they need to be saved just like I did. Amen? Amen. I don't know what that was talking about. That was pretty good. Amen to interject in that. Um, God, I remember now, God loves Israel. And I get, I, listen, I get stuff from people saying, oh, you Jew lover, and, oh, don't you know the Zionists are this, and they're evil, and they're running the New World Order, and they're the ones running the banks, and they're the ones doing this. Yeah, I know that. I know that. I know that some of the most evil, corrupt men in the world who, who are actively bringing in the throne of Satan on this planet right now are of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I get it. And out of that same seed, God's got 7,000. 144,000. He's got them. And He's going to redeem them out of those tribes. Little interpretation of the Bible. Amen? Amen. I had this argument with Brady one time. I thought I had him. And he whipped out that New World Translation on me. And I thought, man, man, he, he opens it out every time. How can it? God got him out. Amen? Okay? God made his promises to them. And anybody who says that we have now replaced the Jews as the true Israel... I'm going to tell you there's an agenda behind it, and 99.9% .9 of the time, it is a racist agenda. It seeks to say that only white Caucasians are the only ones who be saved. I've already got one hate mail this week on this deal, and probably he's watching tonight. He'll probably send me another one. But I'm not backing down from this Bible. I'm not backing up. And I'm here to tell you tonight... That God knows all the, we're, we're, God knows who He's going to call. He made the promises to Israel. He made a covenant. But that covenant, it's just like a, it's just like a, a contract. Let's say that, let's say that Stuart. I, I don't think I've ever picked on Stuart since he's been coming. I wanna, he's sitting here. I want to pick on him. Okay. Let's say that. Get used to this now, Stuart. So let's say that Stuart and I entered into a, a contract. Okay. That I was gonna, I was gonna buy a car from Stewart, okay, and I was gonna, I was gonna pay him three payments, you know, thousand dollars each, and he was going, so he goes, okay, and we have a, we have a written contract, it's legal and all this stuff, and I'm to make three payments. I make one payment to him, and I don't make the other two payments. That con he has every right in the world to come and repossess that car according to the contract. That's contract law in this country. Okay? And it'll hold up in court. He has every right to come to my house. And if I were you, Stuart, I'd keep a set of keys. Okay? And you come, show up my house, those items, and I'll take those keys and I'll put them in the Roll that thing down to the end of the driveway so I don't hear it. Start it up and take off. That's your car legally. Why? Because I breached that contract. It has. Verse chapter 14, verse 34. Remember the 12 spies. The 12 spies went in, and how long were they to go in for? 40 days. Okay? That is a spiritual number there. They go in for 40 days. They come back. Joshua and Caleb, the two. I love it. Those end up being the only two people who left Egypt, physically walked out of Egypt, and physically walked across Jordan River. The only two out of all those, maybe even as much as a million Jews that left Egypt. The rest of them died in the wilderness and their offspring. And that is a picture of how you and I cannot make it into the promised land this way. We must die and a new generation goes in. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? So Joshua and Caleb, the other ten, come back. The, ten? Because it's the law and it's insufficient. Ten come back and say, we can't go in there. 
we are scared of them tall peoples. Okay? Those are the biggest hillbillies we have ever saw. We cannot go in there, and they don't go. But Joshua and Caleb is preaching to them, saying, come on, God's on our side. And they said, no. And God said this, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. And after the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Okay? The covenant that God made was breached by their infidelity, by their hardened heart, by their disbelief, and by their fear. And God said, I'm going to keep my promise, but for right now, I'm not fulfilling my promise. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? My promise is still my promise. It's just that we're going to do it differently now because of the hardness of your heart. And so the breach in the promise was made. That's what Perez represents. Okay? It should have been Zerah that came out first. It should have been the firstborn son that had the rights. But it wasn't. It was Perez. And Perez represents that breach. So here comes the Messiah, clothed with a cloud and the swaddling clothes that Mary laid upon him. He is the Messiah, the King of kings, the Savior of all Israel. Zacharias holding the child and saying, I have seen the Lord's salvation now. I've seen it. And Israel says, crucify him. Kill him. He's not, we don't want him. We want the murdering thief, Barabbas. That's who we want. And God said, breach. He's going to put it back together one of these days. Better believe the Bible. Let me read this very quickly. You remember when the Ark of the Covenant, when David was trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem, they went down to get the Ark of the Covenant. They put it on an ox cart. That's not how you carry the Ark of God. Four Levite priests have got to carry this on their shoulders. It, and by the way, that's a picture of the gospel. You get saved God's way or you don't get saved. Amen? You get saved God's way. So they come in on ox cart, and there's a man by the name of Uzzah on the cart. And the oxen slip, the cart jiggles, the ark is about to fall off the cart. Uzzah reaches out to grab the ark, and God kills him. Because it wasn't done. See, well, listen, when you try another gospel, it doesn't bring life, it brings death. And so Uzzah died. And you know what David, it, the Bible says it grieved David. You know what he called the place? Perez Uzzah. The breach of Uzzah. So here is David's desire to have the ark come into Jerusalem, which is a picture of the salvation of Jerusalem. And there's a breach now because it wasn't done right. And then I don't remember how many months later, I want to say five or seven or something like that, David finally gets it. He says, send some Levites down. And let's do this the right way. And the Bible says that when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in, that there was the trumpets and the shouting taking place. How many of you are ready to hear that one? Amen? Amen. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. But anyway, that was Perez Uzzah. That was a breach. But did God bring the Ark into Jerusalem eventually? Yes, he kept his promise. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 30. Very quickly. Isaiah chapter 30. I don't have to turn there. I'm already there. Let me read it very quickly. Isaiah 30, verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord, look at what he does. He bindeth up the breach of his people, and he healeth the stroke of their wound. Right now, Israel is wounded, and the covenant has been breached. And one of these days, God promised us, associated with the number seven, seven years, the seventh day. It's all there that he's going to bind the breach. Turn to Isaiah 58. I do want you to turn there and underline this in your Bible, and then we're going to be out of here. Isaiah chapter 58. And, and I'm going to give you just a, a, a one-minute practical application of this, okay? Has anybody in here ever been, has, has anybody in here ever thought that God was mad at them? Has anybody in here ever done anything to make them think God was mad at them? Okay? 
So we don't have to go to God and say, God, why are you mad at me? What did I do? You know. Okay? And it felt like you couldn't pray. You couldn't read the Bible. There was no joy in your life. There was no blessings in your life. There was nothing. Your life was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Amen. And God had promised he was going to save you. But your own iniquity made you go backward. Is God still going to save you? He's going to send Isaiah 58 verse 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build of the old waste places. And thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called what? The repairer of the breach. Guess who that is? Zerah is who represents Jesus. Anytime you see a dual birth, you have the first coming and the second coming. Perez represents the first coming where there was a breach. Zerah represents the second coming where there's the repair. See, he's still got the scarlet cord. He's got the proof right here. I'm the firstborn. And I may not, I may not get the inheritance now, but I will get the inheritance. Somebody say amen. amen. And if you've ever been in a situation, maybe, 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 maybe it was this week. Maybe it's before you came to church tonight. Maybe it was after Sunday service. Okay? And we was all full of God and, oh, praise the Lord, and we get out Monday in the world. And, amen. God didn't break His promises. And if, and if, and if, we, if we believe, and I'm saying we and I know we don't, but I know there's people out there that do. If we can believe that God can break a promise... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then who are you and I? We ain't nobody. We have no eternal hope of salvation. We have nothing to rest on. And I love the God and I serve the God that I know is going to repair the breach that I caused. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's the God that I serve. I believe in Israel. Both the adopted Israel and the, and the literal ones. And I believe God's going to save them. Amen? Let's, let's, you know what? Let's ask God. Let's ask God to save Israel. Paul prayed for it. Okay? I'll get to you in a minute, Roy. Paul prayed for it. Why can't we? God will bless you. God will bless you. The Jews are the enemies of the gospel. Bless your enemies. Okay? You're never going to get around the scriptures on this deal. Never. Okay? Pray for yourself tonight. Pray for one another. Pray for Israel. Okay? Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, dear God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for showing me what you've shown me, Lord. I, I can't wait, dear God, to get to Joseph. Lord, I can't wait to get to that. Because, Lord, I remember the first time, Lord God, you were showing me this about Joseph. And Joseph went to his brothers and he wept and he hugged them and he cried on them. And, Lord, you gave me such a heart for the children of Israel, God. Because I know how you feel about them. And Lord, I pray, dear God, like Paul did, I pray, Father, for you to save your people. Repair the breach. Come quickly, Lord. And repair the breach. Lord, their neighbors hate them. People all over the world hate them. They've hated them, dear God, for years. They've been vagabonds and castaways everywhere they've been. And I know, dear God, Lord, they brought it on themselves. But Father, Lord, help me to love them the way you love them. Lord, help me to love lost people, wicked people. The way you love them. Help me to bless them, dear God. Lord, just convict me. 
help me, dear God, be a better Christian, better, better preacher to show the real gospel. Father, bless these people tonight. Bless those that have listened. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just put it in our hearts, dear God, to know that, Father, Lord, even, even when we've kind of gone back on you, you've never gone back on us. Confirm it, Lord, and bless our hearts with it tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believe in e- eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life and you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in his word and God has never broken his word. God promised in his word that he would forgive you and that he would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.